Hi everyone and welcome back to C'est Jackie. Today we are going to talk about Richard II by William Shakespeare. Both, uh, I have Richard II or the person playing Richard II, Stephen Todd Smith, hey! And I'm also in this production as the Queen and Bishop Carlisle. And we have our lovely, wonderful human who's directed us in Romeo and Juliet and who's a wonderful collaborator, Valerie Coniglia. Caniglia? Canelia? Canelia. But that's Canilia. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank Sorry. you for correcting me. You get it <laughs> okay. It's good. There's a G in there. You're good. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> and if you want to see the show, you are in luck because there's still three more performances left. Yes, here in Maryland in Frederick at Hood College, Tatum's Art Center specifically we have three more performances one tomorrow friday august 2nd at 7 30 p.m saturday august 3rd at 2 30 p.m and one last one saturday august 3rd at 7 30 p.m we hope you can join us if you can let me know if not i may or may not have a recording that i've done anywho let's get into it richard the second what is this story about for those people who have no idea what that means or who that is? Oh, wow. I mean, we are going back. We're going back to the, the late 14th century. We're going, we're going those late 1300s, right? And it's this interesting time that almost set this chasm, this, this crack in what normally just passed on, king to king to king to king, king son, king son. And this specific play really takes a deep look at the actual historical happenings, fictionalized by none other than William Shakespeare, um, based on a chronicler, a Raphael Holinshed's uh, chronicling of Richard II's reign. So fictionalized to some extent, but it follows the downfall of Richard II, um, who adopted the kingship, who was made king at a very young age, uh, I don't want to, I won't go like too far into it, but like had a crazy upbringing, obviously innocence lost and became king. And some people did not like the way that he was kinging. And when treasons start to uh, show up in the land, um, Richard has to uh, handle them head on and make some pretty drastic decisions, which ultimately leads Henry Bolingbroke to uh, usurp Richard's throne richard ii does lead into henry the fourth and for at least the first time in a long time if not maybe the first time in that sort of uh lineage of kingship a king is deposed richard falls and henry is crowned and that just sends ripple effects through the rest of english history leading to the war of the roses awesome summary did you know anything about richard ii val before. Nope. <laughs> nope. I knew. No, I really got to be honest with you. I, I didn't know my my knowledge of the histories with with Shakespeare is very, very, very little. Unfortunately, I really only have experience with Richard the mm third. -hmm. Um, I did a production of it in 2018. I was the stage manager on it, but that's and I know a little bit of the lineage, but that's about it. So when Richard my exposure to Richard the second was actually through a Zoom reading mm -hmm. with watching Stephen as Richard II. Yeah. And um, it was, uh, I was I was really taken back by how uh, beautiful this character was and how um, all, all every, every decision he made was very weighted, was very, uh, it had a lot of drastic consequences to it without obviously him knowing and him going through this emotional journey about really giving up the crown. It was really touching to see that. I think what's so beautiful about that Val is what's unique about Shakespeare's works for those who know, you know, more Shakespeare out there. Mm -hmm. You know, you're used to some poetry, you're used to some prose. And when it comes to the histories, I mean, the majority of it is prose. This is the only history that's written in complete poetry. It's complete iambic pentameter mm -hmm. from start to finish, which is a rarity, but it adds that floweriness to it. Uh, so many characters have that enlightened sense to them. Uh, and so when there are drastic decisions or beautiful philosophical explorations, love, hate, 
death and beyond. Um, it does carry this unique poetry to it, which I wonder, Jackie, you know, uh, and, and Val, for maybe knowing some of the other Shakespearean histories, whether or not you know the actual history of it, would you say that the poetry helps to make Richard a bit more understandable or not necessarily from your experience? I think it depends. Um, it depends on what you're saying. There's some of the poetry that's so simple and so like under like well stated that it is really easy to understand. And then there's a lot of the poetry through metaphors, right? Through yeah. uh, whatever turn poetic term you want to use, people are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. And we have to make it make sense and work harder to make it make sense through our emotions and our delivery. That's been so exciting for this specific production mm -hmm. to get feedback from audience members, those who know Shakespeare, those who maybe read Shakespeare in high school and said they didn't understand it, or those who are coming to Shakespeare for the first time. So far, at least from what I've heard, the feedback has been, I understood either all of what was going on or most of what was going on. And that truly means a lot on our end to go, okay, we've relayed this in a beautiful and understandable way. Yeah. yeah. No. Especially because there are so many of those Shakespearean plays that you could watch for the first time, second time, third time, and still have no idea what's going on. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. And the histories can be very dense. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that, that's another thing, you know, uh, they can be very, very dense. You can pick out certain aspects of them to kind of like highlight and spotlight what stands out the most. Obviously, Richard III is just this guy who storms his way to the crown, killing anyone in his way. It's Ooh. more complicated than that, but that's it's more fine. more complicated that's... than that. And, you know, obviously everything in between. And with Richard II, Richard II is so complicated. There are so many drastic decisions that are made, and he has such uh, um, uh, 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 an affinity and also an expertise of how to relay it. Mm -hmm. I can say playing Richard and also once you get to know the play, it is one of the most bipolar roles I have ever played within. Bipolar? The yeah. Um, you know, Richard talking about the history of this character, which isn't necessarily expressed in the play. You don't necessarily, you see Richard when he's a 30, early 30s, right. and these two characters, Thomas Mowbray mm -hmm. and Henry uh, Bolingbroke come and there is this very formal, um, tribunal almost in the kingdom mm -hmm. for treason right but there's so much that happened before then that leads up to us from this 10 year old king and mm -hmm. all of the trials and tribulations that got him here all of the poor decisions all the things that won him over in the people's mind minds all the things that made every lord go we have to stop this king even his uncles who yeah. went whoa this kid's out of control mm -hmm. let's get control and richard is having this moment of going i'm a king god <laughs> Anointed me, God anointed, and so you know we're we're exploring the 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 chasm, the the depths and the complications of the political scheme of mm -hmm. everything. Also, this re very religious means, and you play bishop, which I would say is Richard's connection and and enforcement and foundation to God. Right. Um, but this complication of how can I not be king? God anointed me, and yet when faced with what happens in the play uh being up against all odds and having to come to terms with oh my gosh maybe this isn't the case there is such a bipolarness about it he makes so many rash decisions he goes from um triumph to despair in a heartbeat and his journey happens very poetically from this sense of force all the way to him accepting my peace my nirvana is being nothing after being a king, which is everything to being nothing. Um, so it is, it is very, very complicated. Richard the third, Richard the second, and everyone in between too, but specifically what we're talking about here, it's complicated. Yeah, it's a wild ride, it's a wild ride. Uh, and if you have to choose between triumphant Richard and dejected Richard, which one do you prefer? Like playing, I mean. It's, it's, you know, without it, all of this that I think we're going to share is going to be like little tidbits because we want you to come see it live. We don't want to give exactly. anything away. The, you know, the first half I can say is a lot of triumph and it's very interesting. Uh, we have, uh, we ha have an amazing costume designer and stage manager, uh, Rachel Smith, who just decked us out. 
in this <laughs> medieval wear. The costumes are beautiful. Obviously, if you follow Jackie, you've probably seen photos that she she shared from the show. But to wear the full crown and the shirt and the, oh, that beautiful purple robe and the scepter, there's something about that allows me to hold myself up. I got to say, piece of cake. I got that. That's easy. That's cruising on the top. Um, it's when thing, when, when the, am I allowed to curse on this, Jackie? Absolutely. <laughs> when the shit hits the fan for Richard, <laughs> hey. um, when the shit hits the fan, things get complicated because it's a lot of, the, the the gears in the mind start to shift. In the beginning, it's it's one track maybe presented, but I have to say, I'm doing a lot in my mind. If you're watching me, you'll see the, the eyes start looking at other characters, getting different gauges. So the complications start early, but they really pour out later on. And I love the challenge, the depth, and the emotion of the despair, mm -hmm. of the pity, of the loss, of trying to come to terms with it because it is heartbreaking to read, watch, experience, and to feel. And I love for all the shows that we do to be able to reach that point of really connecting. This show has been my own shadow work in many ways on a personal level, which is a beautiful thing. You know, we, we perform for audiences. We also right. perform for ourselves, right? Um, there is there is both to it. And I can say that this has come at a perfect time in my life just to explore a bit of those dark moments and how to survive through them. So I would say the despair uh, is juicier. Um, that second act is full of what I think are brilliantly written scenes and moments and lines and to get to put them in my mouth and live them through Richard, full body, full mind, full heart and mouth. Um, has been an absolute privilege and pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. I love all of that. And um, if you come see, or no, not if, when you come see Richard the Second Friends, um, you'll see a really tight ensemble. I think our yeah. our group, our whole entire band of actors is really, um, you know, banded together. I'm band banded. Yes, they have. And Both and banded. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and we really uh, have brought on, I think I've really embodied all of these different characters as honestly and truthfully as we can. And uh, a lot of people that I've talked to have really responded positively to our performances and is like, the cast is solid, which is always helpful in telling a story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I get to play one role all throughout. And then Elgin, who plays Henry, Bowling broke is like one role all throughout, but everyone else plays at least two, if not multiple characters. Mm -hmm. um, where a cast could be 20 or 22 people for a Shakespeare play, you know, Val, as you know, from casting things before Jackie, you too. This is what we have, I think, is it 11? 11 people in our cast? 11 or 12, I forget. Something like 11 or 12. Mm -hmm. um, what has been your experience playing two specific roles, the queen mm -hmm. and uh, Bishop of Carlisle? Mm -hmm. um, and what would you say is the vibe for everyone else taking on so much more of a tight ensemble because of the extra roles that they play? That's a great question. I mean, for me, um, I love playing multiple roles. I always do. And it always starts with voice. I mean, from the first read through, I came in with strong decisions on voices for my queen and for Bishop Carlisle. And in through the voice, I thought about the body. And again, like from our first um, like rehearsal where we were on our feet, I already was like, this is how the bishop moves. This is how the queen moves. Uh, and I think everybody had to think about that, had to really think about who are we? <laughs> in this moment, how do we talk? How do we move? How do we think? How do we breathe, right? Um, and, you know, everyone has had their own personal journey with that. Um, Bishop Carlisle and Queen couldn't be more different, which has made it really easy for me to be honest in terms of, of finding the differences. Um, Bishop Carlisle was a bit more difficult for me in terms of finding the voice because our director really didn't want um, British accents, save for like one character. And for me, I play, it's funny, I've been typecast as a bishop several times in Shakespeare production. <laughs> and I immediately go either to the Italian, <laughs> that's how I was in King John, 
<laughs> the villain. Um, I was an Italian cardinal. And then in other things, I've been a British, British bishop, which is easy. But do finding that like American male voice is hard. And I feel like I still hear some of the female, mm. <laughs> which is annoying me, but it's fine. It's fine. It's okay. And then the biggest challenge has been um, the quick changes that I've had to do, especially in act two. I have four scenes from the beginning, from when we start act two, it is back to back to back to back four scenes. The oh my first God. four scenes. And I, at this point, I'm adept at quick changes. I did a show uh, where I had, I think like 12 dresses or 12 <laughs> different like, what? Sounds about, sounds about right. Costumes, sounds, sure. sounds about right, yeah. For a <laughs> three person play. And I was running, throwing off <laughs> clothes and putting it on and coming back on. So that really helped me in terms of doing this. Like this, I'm like, it's fine. It's not that bad. Yes. It's, not that, it's not that hard. Um, and and I think for everybody else, it's been really fun mm -hmm. for them to like find the dichotomies. Like for example, um, one of our actors, Dominique gets to pay, play a loyalist to King Richard and a total traitor to King Richard, which Ooh. I think is dope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, same thing with yeah, same thing with Matt, right? Almost yeah. Richard's closest cousin yeah. to the executioner. Exactly, um, exactly. Uh, same kind of for Mowbray and, and Northumberland. I mean, Mowbray yes. is technically loyalist, and then Northumberland, well, <laughs> not so much. Yeah, and we have, I would say, we have about a two-hour and twenty-minute cut. You know, then yeah. with an intermission, so two thirty all, but a two twenty cut for what it normally is a long play. Mm -hmm. Val, I know that with so many scripts you've done, you've gone through and you've had to make cuts before for scripts, Shakespeare and otherwise. What is your approach when making a cut to a script to try to keep the essence of it, which of course we try to do. I think we do it very, very well, even though there's certain lines that were like, oh, I wish I wish I still had it, but you got to keep it tight. What's what's your approach with with that? Well, I think the most important thing to keep in mind is you have to keep the story moving. So while the, of course, like it, it always does kind of kill me when I have to cut Shakespeare, especially with Romeo and Juliet, as we know, we did, we did do, um, we did a lot of it, but we did do, you know, we did have to make some cuts. And a lot of it, you know, when you look at the script and you go through and you say, you go, you kind of have to take it line by line and say, okay, does this add to the conversation? Does this add to the story? Is it just, you know, kind of superfluous writing. And in the case, you know, I'll go back, I'll use Romeo and Juliet a lot because that was the script that I was, I think, the most involved in Shakespearean wise. And considering that's the show that the three of us, you know, we, you know, that was the, that was the show that we did. Um, I went through line by line and, you know, I, looking at different interpretations of the script, you know, I had a couple copies of the book and I also watched, uh, the National Theatre version was actually very helpful in um, that, in our particular translation. because I was able to kind of get a little bit of a blueprint of what I was looking for. Yeah. And while I was watching it, I said, oh, I really like that line. And I was like, and I want to keep that or, oh, they cut that sequence or they took it out of, or they took this scene and put it here instead. And they kind of Frankensteined it a little bit, um, which was something that I really didn't, I knew I didn't really want. Um, so anyway, after going through the script and then going line by line, you have to say, okay, does this work for the story? Does this work for the character? My, you know, as a director, your vision of the character, and then kind of just take it from there. And then, you know, it, what's great is when you read it with the cast and they have suggestions about maybe something that they would like to add that they think works, you could try it out. And if it works great and if it doesn't work you can kind of go eh, well maybe maybe not this iteration maybe next time only because it doesn't fit with the story that i'm trying we're trying to tell yeah and it can be and it can be tricky um and it can also be a little bit of a gamble because you know you're making these cuts to the script that's been around for 400 years and sometimes you don't know if it was the right move or if it was the wrong move um but you know at the end of the day I, all stories are interpreted a different way yeah. yeah. Uh, with this version, is there any lines that you that either of you wish were still kept in the script that you wish you could say? I have no I idea. Added, I added some <laughs> back in. <laughs> I added some he back has in. An idea. Which is which I do. Like I, you know, listen. When it comes when it comes down to it, 
performing Shakespeare in, in full, there's something that is quite magical and foundational about it. Maybe you need a certain audience who can fully appreciate it because Shakespeare's no good if people are falling asleep. And I'm not saying that that is the case for all productions, but if that is the case, it might be counterintuitive and counterproductive to try to tell that full story, right? So yeah. cutting it all of a sudden puts it into at least a 2024 mindset of, oh, I can, I can handle a two and a half hour play, that's fine. Even mm -hmm. if I'm learning this language for the first time. So there's something about cutting it and then maybe like empowering the actors, mm -hmm. you know, read through the full script. If there's anything you want to add back in that's valuable to it, then we go from there rather than feeling like, you know, you're, you're cutting out all your kids and you're like, no, 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 I want that, I want that. <laughs> but if you give the actors a, a cut script and that's where it's at, like Jackie said, Jackie, you said like, you're, you're, you're good with it. I mean, I don't think they like I'm playing two characters and my characters don't talk a lot in the original script. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anything has been cut from my characters because they don't talk a lot. You're batting <laughs> a thousand. You're a hundred percent. I'm a hundred percent. I checked. I was like, I not a word has cut. been cut. <laughs> um, but, there, you know, what was interesting, Val, was going through and rehearsing and seeing the parts where like, ooh, we could make this work, but there's something that's missing from the original text when going back, you're like, oh, that's, that's what gets you there. And so talking with the director going, hey, I would love, and not a lot, um, but like, I'd love these, these four lines here. I'd love these three lines there. Just that extra bit, that extra thought, that extra idea helps to really make whatever we're trying to do clear. Because it didn't seem like it was fully clear. And the majority okay. is, but I think when you do cut, you do battle those moments. You have to either tell it non-verbally, um, visually, uh, or something else to really sort of like tie it together because you don't want those loose ends. So there were a couple, um, besides, besides being beautiful passages that I know I was like, I think this will help keep the scene going. It'll help it make sense. Then we don't have to tr try to force a round peg in a square hole sort of thing. And I, I think it's worked out really well. Um, Jackie, for your information, it, it's during the uh, castle scene 3-3 three, three with Richard and O'Merle when things okay. are looking not so good. And then it's at the very, very end, Richard's final monologue. Um, got you. 5-5. I'm not going to tell anyone else anything else. Okay, <laughs> you've added it. Okay, I got you. They just have to come see the play. You no, know, this is just exactly. a teaser. But this is a lot of good stuff. It, it really is. It really is. Yeah. What has been one thing that you haven't liked about the process or about playing Richard II? That I have to work my full-time job during the day and mm. then come to performances. Um, and we were talking about this just a moment ago before we started this. You know, of course, the, the, the dream, the ideal is for it to be a full-time job where you get to really, you know, obviously you live your life, but the, the character, the character is it. It is the fullness. You wake up in the morning run through lines, whatever you go about your day, self-care, self-care, you show up at call, you do the role, rinse and repeat over and over and over again. It's almost like the other life things are becoming the interruption in my Richard journey. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, but like, that, you know, just to frame it like that, this is such a massive juicy role besides being one of my favorite Shakespeare plays, one of my favorite roles, one that I've been waiting on for a very, very, very long time with a lot of deep seeds that, um, think just it was the right time for this tree to grow. Um, I, I wish I had that and I wish we had a longer run because mm. I don't know that I'm ready to give up Richard just yet. And I know there will be other opportunities, but in this iteration, at least being the first full production of him um, for two weeks and, you know, a, a month long rehearsal process plus whatever other time of some scattered work before, uh, I just, I just want more. So I think that's what sticks out the most for me. How about you? Um, before I answer that question, I, I, I went and searched for Richard II's um, text because I was like, wait, let me check. And there were lines cut. <laughs> I was wrong. I was wrong. Uh, the queen has some lines cut. I was like, wait, I don't say this. Uh, what is this? The queen has spoken. The oh my gosh, spoken. Evan, <laughs> we need to talk. But anyhow, um, for me, I think the most frustrating thing that it's been, and I and I've talked to you about it, is like I wish I were in it more. And and this was one of the um, notes that one of my good friends 
and, and another friend mentioned to me, they were like, we loved you. You were wonderful. You were not in it enough. <laughs> and then like, we didn't get to like, you were there, but like, you didn't talk a lot. <laughs> I was like, fair. And I agree. And I felt that I felt that this whole journey where I was like, man, I wish I were in this way more. <laughs> yeah. I, I think my two roles are important yeah. and are weighty and are felt and, you know, have um, a really important role. Both play extremely important roles in the telling of who Richard is uh, and supporting that narrative of, of Richard's rise and fall, which I love. But yeah, I, I wish I were in this a lot, lot more, but I can't complain. I. I you live it out fully, right? You, you you put you pour everything into what you have. Uh, mm -hmm. In high school, sophomore year, we did Grease, the musical mm -hmm. Grease. Ah. Yeah, I, got I played Kaniki. Uh, that was my that was my musical debut. Uh, <laughs> scr scrawny white kid uh, in, in a white t-shirt. Um, but the controversy, the controversy was who was going to play Danny Zuko, and everyone thought certain dude was going to play Danny Zuko. He's oh. the best one there. Yeah. But someone else got cast as Danny, and everyone was like, what? And the dude um, was cast as a Teen Angel. Now, Teen oh. Angel is a show-stopping role, right? Yeah. And he was in it very, very little because he only had that cameo, but it brought the house down every time. And while he would have been great as Danny, I don't know if there was anyone else who could have played Teen Angel, and that would have been a bit of a lackluster big climactic you know mm -hmm. musical scene so there's something about obviously loving and wanting to play leads i'm right there with you this is my first full i mean while we still have full ensemble especially with the doubling and triple of tripling of roles mm -hmm. but as far as like richard the second being like in the top 10 for most lines out of any shakespeare character right. this is the first time for me in an actual on stage production separate from virtual zoom productions of playing a lead in that sense. I've been in ensemble, I've been a lead in ensemble ways, but to take on this helm um, is super, super exciting. And I totally get that. And the question becomes when you're not that and you're someone else who has less time, how do you still make sure that you put all of the love and the heart and the talent that you have yeah. into it? Um, because that still holds everything up. Thousand um, percent. Right? Thousand percent. Yeah. And yeah. to clarify, I don't, I didn't want to be the lead in this. I don't even want to be the lead in this. Like people this who know not, me know I was doing much. the most. I was doing way too much. The lead would have killed me. Any lead would have killed me. But I think, you know, like there's some, some roles where I'm like, y'all would have ate in that shit for breakfast. That, that being said, I'm very thankful for the two roles I have. I love yeah. it. I just know. You know, now now that I've done this, I'm hungry yeah. for more. I'm I'm happy to go back to a bigger role <laughs> in the show. Would you say that all of our virtual theater that we have done over the past four years has, in the most beautiful way, spoiled us because we've had the opportunity to play so many lead roles that maybe we wouldn't have played before? Or on the other side of things, has it opened the door and shown the light of, oh my gosh, this is possible. Let's do this. So for me, Fortunately, the virtual world has translated into the real world since 2021, and I've been the lead role in a lot of production since from 2021 to now. And so every year I'm the lead in at least like, if not one, four shows. <laughs> and because of that, I'm used to to being the driving force of a lot of shows. That being said, I, I do so many shows where I'm not the lead. And there are so many other shows where I'm not the lead that I love with all my heart. Um, mm. Some are in my favorite credits. If you ever read my bio, friends, like theater bio, you'll see most uh -huh. of them that are my favorite are not lead roles. Mm. And some are. Um, so it just, it depends on the show. It depends on what I'm doing, what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, depends on a lot of factors. I just I think I love everybody so much in this show too in this in this yeah. play that I want to I want to interact it's not even about being a bigger role necessarily it's just about having more time to connect with more people in the show and I don't get that opportunity because I'm playing two smaller roles and I think that's that's what's what ails me a little yeah do you do either of you get 
I, I don't know how to word this question. Mm. I'm going to do my best. So bear with me. But when you start the play, mm. you know, as the two of you as actors performing the play, do you ever find yourselves like completely lost in the piece to the point that like you kind of forget what's about to happen? And then you, you know what I mean? Like, do you find yourself like starting out your characters or your actor, the show is Steven and then Jackie. And then also, you know, throughout the play, you do become eventually these Richard II, the queen and the bishop, you know, kind of get lost in the story. Does that ever, has that ever happened to you during the run? During I don't know if that play? question makes sense. That's a, it makes know, a lot of sense. It absolutely makes so much sense. And it's mm -hmm. so uniquely complicated because I think it also touches on actor technique the method or the approach to it, which yeah. I'm excited, Jackie, if you want to go first, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you everything that I do during the play. Uh, <laughs> because I, I couldn't just I couldn't just stroll up, like I call time and be like, Okay, I'll do this. <laughs> I want to maybe I'll, maybe I could. Yeah, no, I'm not even gonna give myself credit. I need to take time and somewhat do my best to disappear while not letting go of Steven to disappear into it. But Jackie, I would love to hear like your specific approach. And I know this, these roles might be different from other roles that you did. Right, right. Yeah. It's like you talked to me about Miss Evers. Yeah. 1000% I lost myself in her 1000%. Uh, for this, um, you know, I, I'm not actually much of a method person. <laughs> It's funny, people think I am because, you know, they watch me and they're like, you must have a method to your acting, to your madness, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, no, I, I really don't. I just am like, and then we go. Um, I think, uh, yes, the answer is yes, I have lost myself in the story and in, in playing these two roles of Bishop Carlisle and the Queen, but only in moments. I think there has been maybe we've had four performances or five, five performances already. And in the five, there have maybe been two where I lost myself most of the play. In a good, uh, in, in, like lost yourself in the character, like you in the character, the like I, you. I was the character and I was Jackie was not a part yeah. of it yeah. at all. Um, one, I, I can think of those moments, either hearing them or seeing them too, and and they're it's beautiful when that happens. Thank you. I mean, for me, Bishop was definitely Monday, our Monday performance. Like I felt like the Holy Spirit was within me, <laughs> and I was no longer like thinking about my line, thinking about who I was, thinking about my block. None of that. I was just speaking righteous indignation and was just ah, whether at the king or at his yeah. traitors. Yeah. And then for the queen, um, I think it was that like Sunday, Sunday afternoon, Sunday yeah, afternoon, where I was like, I am now the queen and I am fully dialed in and feeling all of the things. And Jackie is is not anywhere near here. Mm -hmm. And it was and I love I love being lost personally. I, I, yeah, totally adore those moments. I think it's important though to know how to ground yourself. If I didn't know who I am, if I didn't know, like if in Jackie wasn't such a strong presence, I think being lost would be very dangerous. But for me, it's so easy to find who I am right after I'm done. That, not right after I'm done, but but like, yeah. whenever I get back to Jackie, I will always find her. You almost get to both be in it and also witness it mm -hmm. at the same time. At least that I, I think that is an experience. I think that's how acting can become both an out of body experience, but also the deepest fully in your body experience, but free from all of the things that hold you back from expression and emotion and such. Yeah. There's a beautiful song by Schaefer James, a brilliant artist called Learning to Be Lost. And, um, I, it is on my Richard soundtrack, especially when it's a hefty role. I like making playlists for my characters. I think there's Ooh. something about the musical journey. Jackie, I know you have a few songs also that you shared with me for Queen. Um, Ooh, okay. What's on the, wait, I want to hear more about oh. these playlists, but we could definitely discuss that a little bit later, but that's oh. awesome. For the whole yeah, thing. yeah. My, my playlist is, is filled with a lot of instrumentals because it's perfect to get into my mind while I also potentially run through lines. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, uh, it's Julia Kent, Philip Glass, Max Richter, Ezio Bosco, Tommy Prophet and Fleury. Uh, it is Schaefer James, Ludovico uh, Ianaldi, 
uh, Future Islands, and then Sylvain Chalveau. It is, um, personally, the music that I've curated for this is like an hour and a half, and I think it is the journey of mm. Richard's mind. Um, but Learning to Be Lost is a song that I pop in my headphones backstage during uh, 4-1. Um, I, I've, I've heard, I, and even, even with noise cancellation, I can hear the righteous indignation of Bishop, Bishop of Carlisle uh, shutting <laughs> down that kingdom. That's how I know my cue is about to come on because Bishop <laughs> is laying things down for Richard. Um, but this song, Learning to Be Lost, has become almost my anthem in some ways. I can't not listen to it now. I can't listen to it and not break down because the beauty of the music and the lyrics and how much it touches me in regard to Richard. Um, but there's a difference between like feeling lost, like, oh my gosh, where am I? What am I gonna do? What's my line? That type of lost. And I think, and I, I don't know if we took that question in a different direction, Val, but the being lost <laughs> of finding the character. It, it is totally a duo of being lost and also being found at the same time. I can think of a role that I did way back in New York one time. It was a three person play. Mm. And I felt like I was just Steven saying the lines, mm. acting my ass, acting, 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 whatever. And mm -hmm. it, that I would associate with being the most lost and being lost from character, but mm. knowing the play and doing it, not ever blanking out. There's never been a moment of lost of like, uh-oh, uh-oh, what to do, what to say, or whatever else. And those things happen with actors, anyone in, in the ensemble, we all take care of each other. But what Jackie was talking about of being lost and then finding yourself with the character and bearing witness to it. We've had five shows, I, I would say three out of the five. I think I reached that point and oh, it is glorious. It is such a good, 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 good feeling. I lie on the stage at the very end, for whatever reason, I'm lying on the stage and <laughs> my eyes closed. And I think I fucking love doing this so much. Um, that's the thought that goes through my head. On the nights where, where it's not that, I still am like, this was a good time, uh, <laughs> but it's not quite the same. Um, I, I love to show up early and just kind of stretch, get out of my body, especially if I call into basic call the things that we have to do. Um, just to just let go of as much stress and whatever happened outside the theater as possible to make me, you know, we are our instrument as open as possible. And to have all these lines in the head somehow, it blows my mind because it's another thing of going, how did I learn all these lines and how am I going to do it? And it just happens. So you almost have to lose yourself in that. You know it so much that you've lost yourself. When you're driving and it becomes a meditation and you're like, I didn't need a GPS. I knew where I was going automatically. That's mm -hmm. what it's like. Um, but those moments where the emotion hits in a way where you're like, oh, there's something deeper about the text, the essence of the play, the character, the moment, the connection. I'm living not, I'm not living on stage with Jackie in this moment. I'm living on stage with my queen. And this is the last time we're going to see each other. And all of a sudden we're just bawling our eyes out and it's a beautiful thing. Obviously we haven't lost control. We're harnessing it. But this is the type of play that I think. You know, I'll, to, to be honest, in the three shows that I've done where I've gotten to that point, I go, fuck yeah. And the two that I haven't, I still get very critical at myself and I go, oh, I let my cast down. I didn't, I didn't gift them. I didn't give them the full juiciness that they, I mean, and everyone's great in it. Like y'all don't need it, but you know what I mean? So it, it, it is a fascinating thing to hit different points. What I love about everyone in this cast is that I think regardless of whatever level they're at, we hit it. We do it, we forge through it, and we work really well together. So the story is still told regardless of what we feel. But for me, yeah, I love whether it's music or something that's kind of bodily, obviously costume, holding things in position. It really, really helps. And when things are flowing, it's just a domino effect of the next of the next of the next to carry the emotion from one scene over to the next and go, oh, this is going to be good. The tear, you know, and tears don't mean good or great acting or anything necessarily but i know that when the f oh the a volcano that's that that's the analogy jackie the one i the analogy i gave you the last time was not a fun one um but a volcano listen a volcano on its own is quite an impress impressive thing just to see a volcano is beautiful and i hope all of us consider ourselves at some time volcanoes but 
when that volcano erupts, oh, what an experience it is. So it's really nice when the catalysts and the chemistry and the alchemy of everything that's happening, the inner work, but the connection with everyone else allows for an eruption. Um, those, those are the cool, cool moments of being lost and completely found and living this character, feeling like you're truly, truly doing full service to this text that was written <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of years ago. It's really interesting because it, it's, I mean, I'm really excited to see the both of you in this play and to see, because I've seen the both of you perform together at least, what, how many times now? Twice? Uh, twice? No, three. It has, it has to be more Couple than Couple times. It's been multiple times at this point. Yeah. yeah. Between, between like Taming of the Shrew. Yeah. Um, it's true. I, don't, I think you saw uh, Shakespeare in Love. Oh, that was a long time I, ago, Shakespeare. I yeah. did Shakespeare in Love, yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yes. Even though I forgot I did Jackie, Shakespeare in Love. I think that was our very, Steven. very first time doing yeah. virtual theater together. Yeah. I, mean, I didn't even know it. Plenty that was, times. um, yeah. yes, yes, Shakespeare. Oh, she, oh Shakespeare. Yo. Yes. Yo, I remember that. Throw back, throw uh, back. Seen, yeah, Taming of the Shrew, Shakespeare in Love, obviously Romeo and Juliet. Mm -hmm. Last Days of Judas Iscariot. Mm -hmm. Iscariot. Um, any of the other COVID Shakespeare think, Star Wars we've done Shakespeare together. Star Wars. Um, I mean, we didn't interact much in no. that or in. I think those were the, yeah, the, 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 those two especially, Romeo and Juliet, which I think also set Jackie and I up for having this, even though that was virtual and the King and the Queen, we are now on stage together. Obviously, we did Miss Evers Boys together um, before. But, but totally different vibes. Totally different vibe. <laughs> but it's a romantic, a romantic vibe. It just, it helps that much more to have a level of comfort with the person that you are sharing intimacy with on, on, sta on stage. Yeah, thousand percent. Well, the thing, and what I was gonna say was that it was so, um, it, it's, I've seen you guys kind of, the both of you kind of transform into your role, specifically with Romeo and Juliet. When I was watching, when we were watching live, it wasn't, you know, it started out obviously like, you know, just Stephen and Jackie, but then the transformation into Romeo and Juliet, it was very beautiful. To, to witness and to see and, and experience too, because it was the first time, especially for a lot, for people that weren't too familiar with it and myself included actually, that I actually was able to feel something for those characters. So I can only imagine the chemistry that was on the screen translated onto the stage. And I am so excited to see the, the, the electricity that, and the chemistry that the both of you have um, as actors and as friends, as collaborators that, you know, it's just very palpable. I can't wait to see that on stage. I'm so excited. I mean, Romeo and Juliet, speaking of losing oneself, I, and you know, I told you that story. Like I went from closing a show, friends. I know, I know I'm it, in the membrane. You're closing insane. a show <laughs> to getting to my house, prepping for a Romeo and Juliet, being like, I'm going to stand though. I'm exhausted. <laughs> I have no mental or physical energy for this ish but it's fine i'm gonna give my best the way i can mm. and um yeah i had zero expectations of me being good <laughs> it's like I i'm just gonna give what i'm gonna give and then i don't know what happened from the first scene i completely juliet was here jackie was gone and it was juliet until the end mm. yeah yeah it was fun it was what fun. is the what is the one thing that's going to be the hardest about saying goodbye Oh, you and I, kismet. I was thinking the same question. Well, great question. I'll let you, Stephen, answer first. Um, I, uh, as you can tell, I like Richard. I have trouble keeping things succinct. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you back to my introduction to Richard, especially doing all of, and I'm gonna take you back. I, it, I have to, I have to, because this is, this play is so meaningful to me on so many levels in my own just personal and whatever professional life it may be with acting. Um, for doing so much theater in New York uh, after school and then moving to Los Angeles and doing some improv but fading out of theater and then really being out of it for a while. Um, doing a lot of virtual theater come 2020 so that was my Shakespeare education, really. Well, I had some experience before with scenes, and I did one play that had an infamous opening and closing night because of a cast member injury. Uh, I had never done a full production, a full run of a Shakespeare show, um, and nothing to this extent. And then moving to Baltimore, um, 
connecting, you know, while knowing Jackie virtually, but she being like, I'm in Maryland, get your ass into some theater. And, you know, getting a kind of kickoff with a, a one show for Miss Evers Boys and then a small little gig. And then this, um, the big thing is it's brought me back to live theater, like live theater, a full run, the full rehearsal process, the full character work for the first time in a long time. Uh, back in 2021, um, after doing a whole bunch of virtual theater, we had done Richard once or twice. I always wanted to play him and I wasn't being cast as him, I was being cast as other roles. And um, I just wanted to play Richard. And so I was like, well, hey, start doing it on your own. And so I started memorizing one of the, one of the monologues. Uh, Let's talk of graves, of worms and epitaphs, make dust our paper and with rainy eyes, write sorrow on the bosom of the earth. So I started memorizing this on one day and I came home excited to be working on it, getting these lines down. And it unfortunately just so happened to be the day where after popping out the music in my ear while running through these lines, I heard my beloved cat Guster uh, crying from upstairs and he had he had, had a, a medical uh, emergency of, of some sort, which I don't know how long I was downstairs working on this monologue while he was crying until I finally heard him. And I rushed him to the ER and um, it was a, one of those unfortunate things that the doctor said, the vet said, there's nothing we can do. The, the, the most um, uh, 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 humane thing to do is to put him to, to sleep is to say goodbye. And he was, you know, 13, 14 years old. He was my guy. He was my dude. He showed up in many, many of a virtual reading. Uh, the infamous one being uh, Thor Ragnarok. He a uh, picture of me holding him with the Thor outfit. <laughs> but um, I, uh, we said goodbye to Guster that night. And I uh, put this monologue away for a while because the monologue talks a lot about despair and death and loss. And I just couldn't handle it. And then uh, months went by and I decided it's time to pick it back up again. Uh, you owe it to yourself, you owe it to Guster, and you, you love this, you, you want this, you wanna be ready with it. So that was my monologue for a while. And then finally, earlier this year, uh, the opportunity for Richard II virtually happened again. Wonderful Magdalene uh, from our Friday night group said, okay, I, I got you. And I got to play Richard finally. Um, and obviously we're reading lines, but we're performing our butts off. And it was great, but it still felt like, I wanna put this on stage, I wanna get this on stage. And in whatever series of events needed to happen, all the stars behind Jackie just aligning and shooting off. Uh, an audition popped up shortly after for this specific production of Richard. The role was not available at the time, um, but unfortunately the lead who was playing Richard had to drop out due to personal emergency. And it, I just so happened to stroll in with a monologue of let's talk of graves, of worms and epitaphs. And it was exactly what they wanted and needed. And um, this has felt like a completion from that seedling that was planted years ago and a tribute to my my guy um, my prince guster um and also like i mentioned before for doing some shadow work in life right now for kind of taking a look at the light and the dark which there are so many metaphors in the play uh, about that um it's been a deeply palpable <laughs> uh multi-layered experience not just with acting but exploring living learning with the role and so for all of those reasons uh it's going to be difficult to say goodbye to it so quickly because i want to dive deeper and i think i think you will i think you will i think it, it's out there it's it's not done yeah journey's not done yeah no it isn't for either yeah. for this no for for a fact for a fact I think what I'll miss the most, um, I think, you know, it's funny since I've, I've started my full time um, artist career, you know, actor, director, AD, uh, there have been some productions that have been written in the stars and that are, oh, I don't even <laughs> want to cry, um, but that are like that come into my life for a reason. And, you know, this one is one of those where everything was, was basically against this happening for me personally, because um, I, I had already made up my mind earlier this year to go to Vermont um, to do, uh, to audition and hopefully be cast in Shakespeare in the Woods. Uh, because this year they were doing Macbeth and Twelfth Night 
and Macbeth is my top three in my top three favorite Shakespeare plays. I, I can do that show for the rest of my life. And Twelfth Night, though not my favorite comedy, is, is in the top of my favorite comedies. It's a perfect ensemble show. Um, you can put me in like one of six or seven roles and I will be a happy camper. Like I will not complain. Um, and so I was just determined to do that this summer. Uh, and when Richard II came, like I immediately thought of Stephen, sent it to him and was like, I'm, I'm going to audition for shits and giggles, but like, this is not, this is not for me. <laughs> One, I'm not, <laughs> Richard II doesn't speak to me. I'm not super interested. Two, Macbeth and Twelfth Night. Yeah. There's no, nothing more than that. And, and you know, God has a way of laughing at our plans. <laughs> and yeah. and uh, a way to be like, oh, oh, that's what you think your your plan is, oh baby, baby, that's not the plan. And so, what I will miss the most about this show is all the connections. I feel like, out of all of the plays I've done this year in twenty twenty four, this play is probably the one I've made the most genuine connections to other humans and that has fulfilled my soul like that's one of the biggest reason why I act is to tell stories stories that people don't know to and and to connect with human beings yeah. for beings to see how we connect to each other um and I've connected with a lot of of human beings in this show and then like we were talking about seeing how the virtual trust and intimacy has like, um, what is the word? Translated. Oh, translated. Transformed. Transformed or translated, I think you translated. said first. Translated to IRL, to in real life, has also been so special for me. So incredible. Like I, I always, and I talked about this with my friend Lorraine and a few other actors, I always give in, like I, I put in, maybe more than I should, in every role that I do, I put my all. And I don't get that reciprocate, reciprocated very often. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And so it, it, can fin it can feel very unfulfilling yeah. to pour your heart, soul, mind, body, everything into a story and a human. And when you're trying to connect with another person, they're only giving you a certain percentage back. It, it can feel, yeah, very unfulfilling. And here, I feel you pouring everything you have into Richard II, and it just makes me want to be that much more connected. And I love it, and I'm going to miss it. And miss it a lot yeah uh it has been beautiful um taking that seedling from the virtual and you know and and moving it to irl moving it to on stage getting mm -hmm. to explore what i imagine is going to be so many different productions together so many different roles and relationships um but to especially get to do this one um, and early on with everything that you just shared about the possibilities of where to go and what to do. I remember we talked and, you know, the only advice I could give was do what is going to make you the happiest. Mm -hmm. uh, selfishly, do this fucking role, please. That would be awesome. I'd love to <laughs> perform with you, um, especially since you did send that initial audition my way. You helped, in, as far as my story goes, you helped plant that seed. Mm -hmm. you know with that and we can keep on looking back to romeo and juliet and val directing that and then chemistry building and connection really oh my gosh oh jackie steve yeah of course we didn't know each other but now we know each other um this crew this this crew uh directors stage managers actors uh lighting designers uh everyone who has participated in any way with it um have shared laughs with have made friendships with have experienced the tumult and the emotion of the play directly with have experienced seeing magic with certain things that they do during different shows and receive wonderful feedback from them. Um, it has, we've become a really tight Shakespearean circuit and we just keep each other lit so much. And that is 
um, you don't always get that. That is something that is, is special and it is hard to, hard to believe. Um, yeah. So we live it out to the fullest. We're gonna create the brightest light that we can for our remaining three shows together. The brightest light, if you wanna see the brightest, uh, bring your sunglasses and check us out. Um, but it's, uh, it is, it has, it is, it has, and always will um, be such a joy to perform amazing works with amazing people and get to get lost to be found. On that note, thank you for watching friends and come see this play. <laughs> and again, if you, you can't because you know, physical limitations or whatever, just holler at your girl, I'll send you the recording that I have. Jackie, you're gonna share a link somewhere for all these people to, to check out the show, right? To buy oh, absolutely. Email. It'll be um, in the information check of this YouTube video, you already know. And if you wanna support um, our dreams, cause you know, we're all trying to just like, um, be Tyler Perry's over here, you know, Shonda Rhimes over with Freeze, trying to create networks so that we can share incredible stories with y'all and share our artistry and our, basically our mind, bodies and souls with you. If you wanna make that happen, please support us financially too. And I'll put all of our financial info in the info of this YouTube. Merci, je vous aime. Thanks for tuning in for those of you who tune in. <laughs> Let us know if you come to the show and Au we'll revoir. see you at our next video. Merci. Merci. Ciao. Ciao.